Next up, then, what we're going to look at is intermolecular forces. And intermolecular forces, if we analyze the name, intermolecular forces mean that we have forces that act between molecules. Because the prefix inter means between. So there's going to be forces that act between molecules. And they're broken down into two main categories. They are van der Waals forces. And we skip down a couple lines here. We also have hydrogen bonding or hydrogen bonds. And van der Waals forces consist of two subtypes. They are what we call dipole-dipole forces and London forces. And London forces are not named after the city of London, but rather after the person who is given credit for first describing them. Sometimes London forces are also called dispersion forces. We're going to start by looking at dipole-dipole forces. Now if we analyze the word dipole, dipole would imply that we have something that's comprised of two Polarity. poles. It's going to be polarity, exactly. It's going to be a polar molecule. Something that has two poles. And so dipole is the same as a polar molecule. There's a molar a polar molecule has two poles. It has a partially positive pole, partial negative pole. And so these here are forces that act between polar molecules. Now if we were to give an example, we could look at something like HCl. And in HCl, we've already drawn out the structure for HCl. We have a structure that looks something like this, H-Cl. I'm going to show the extra dots around the chlorine. If we go back to our previous example on these, we saw that hydrogen had an electronegativity of 2.1 and the chlorine had an electronegativity of 3.0 which means that these chlorines would get labeled partially negative, hydrogens get labeled partially positive. Now if we had more molecules of HCl, those additional molecules of HCl would line up in a very predictable manner. And they would always line up in a manner such that the partially positive hydrogen of one atom is always near the partial negative atom of a different molecule. And so if we went one more level right here, let's say we had another layer of HCl, the other layer would look something like this. And the reason why the other layer looks something like this is because again the partially negative chlorines of one molecule are going to have an attraction for the partially positive hydrogens of a different molecule. And so, well, if I went through and finished labeling all of these here, we have something like this. And so now what I'm going to show, let's put this here in a kind of a, maybe this blue color. What I'm showing here in blue now represents these intermolecular forces. And this basically is representing an attraction that occurs between the atoms of these different molecules. There's an attraction that exists here. There's another one that exists here because there's a partially positive chlorine of one molecule attracting a partially positive hydrogen of a different molecule. Where again, those little squiggly lines that I've drawn, and this is my way of representing, representing it, what this represents is a dipole-dipole force. And again, it's simply an attraction between 
partially positive atom of one molecule and a partial negative atom of a different molecule. And again, dipole-dipole forces act within these polar molecules. Now we're going to contrast that with London forces. If we look at London forces, London forces, which again we also call dispersion forces, these are forces that are present in all molecules, but they're the only force present in nonpolar molecules. Now, for these, we give several different types of examples. We could talk about something like H2 or carbon tetrachloride. We could look at helium atoms themselves as being attracted by the London forces. Once again, basically anything that is nonpolar. If we look at something like helium atoms, these are <clears throat> the easiest to look at. We could look at the construction of a helium atom. And to look at the construction of a helium atom, we look at what's in the nucleus. And how many protons would be in the nucleus of an atom of helium? So I go back to the periodic table, we look at helium. How many protons would we find in the, in the nucleus? Maybe two. And I'm just showing it two positives. And if we had another helium atom, there'd be two protons in the nucleus of a neighboring helium atom as well. But then if we start putting in electrons, helium is also going to have two electrons. Now ordinarily, those electrons would be randomly distributed within the helium atoms. We don't know exactly where they are because the motion of the electrons is random. And so at any point in time, they could be like this, they could be like this, this, any possible position they could wind up orienting themselves into. But let's say all of a sudden that they wind up moving so they are both on the right-hand side of this first um, helium atom. Well, what happens then is that this side of the helium becomes partially negative, and this side over here becomes partially positive. Partially negative simply because they have the negatively charged electrons. Well, then we remember what we learned earlier this semester, and that is like charges tend to repel each other. And so these electrons are going to tend to repel electrons in a neighboring helium atom. So it could wind up something like this. This makes this partially negative. That makes this side partially positive. And as a result, then there winds up being an attraction between the two helium atoms. And that is an example of a dispersion force. But because these electrons are moving rapidly in here, at the very next instant in time, they could wind up having a more symmetrical distribution of electrons. It gets rid of the uh, dipole. It disappears. And we are back to something like this, and there's no longer any attraction that's present. At the next instant in time, maybe this particular helium atom winds up with electrons that are distributed like this. If that's the case, the left-hand side of this helium atom requires a partially negative charge. The right-hand side is partially positive. These negative charges will repel the electrons in a neighboring atom, making this side partially negative, this side partially positive. And as a result now, I have a partial positive and a partial negative near each other. They then will wind up attracting each other. But again, this is only going to be something that's very temporary in nature. The next instant needs to go back to more even distribution, and there's going to be no longer any attraction that occurs between them. And this is something that we're showing only two atoms. Remember that in a real substance, this is going to be something that's in three dimensions. And so there's going to be attractions that are going to be occurring in all different directions, 
And when they do occur, they're going to be very, very temporary because of the constant motion of electrons in these atoms. Now, I do have an animation that shows this here and shows the difference. Um, this first animation is one that's showing dipole-dipole forces. And as they come into the screen here, the blue portion represents the um, partially positive portion. The red here represents the partial negative portions. And the glowing yellow represents those dipole-dipole forces. And you can see here that there's a continuous attraction that occurs between the partially negative portion of the one molecule and the partial positive of a different. And once again here, as they wind up going off the screen, they do have that attraction for each other. When we compare that to the London forces, and the London forces, this here is showing a molecule of hydrogen, or H2, and when you see it getting fat, that's where those electrons are in the same hydrogen atom in that molecule. And you're going to see that when it gets fat, it's also going to be kind of reddish color, which is kind of that, um, that buildup of negative charge. And there's only going to be attraction that occurs whenever the partial negative of one is near the partial positive of the other. But again, it's only something that's temporary and it disappears as those electrons move about randomly within the molecules. And so the London forces, again, one of the things that makes these London forces a little bit weaker is because these London forces are only temporary. They exist temporarily, then they disappear. They exist again, then disappear. Exist and disappear. And it all has to do with the random motion of electrons within those molecules. And then the last one, that we'll look at here today is called hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding, we say, is a special type of dipole-dipole force that is very strong and occurs in molecules where hydrogen is directly bonded to either nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. And so then the first question is going to be this. What is it that's so special about the nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine? Well, we look at where they're located on the periodic table. We see they're all kind of located right here in the cluster. But the other thing we should see is that these three elements have the three highest electronegativity values. Now, you might contend that chlorine is also up there because its electronegativity is the same as nitrogen. But chlorine does not exhibit hydrogen bonding simply because nitrogen can make up to three bonds with hydrogen whereas the chlorine can only make one bond with the hydrogen. So it's only when these three elements are bonded directly to the hydrogen. So again, that key when we talk about it, directly bonded, that's another important thing. Because if we look at these two, these two molecules have an identical number of carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens. However, only one of these two would have hydrogen bonding. They both have two carbons, six hydrogens, and one oxygen. Which one would have hydrogen bonding? Would it be this one here or this one here? And why this one? Because it's bond one hydrogen bonded to the oxygen. Right. This one here is the hydrogen directly bonded to the oxygen. This one here, the oxygen is bonded to the carbons. It's not bonded to the hydrogen. So this one here is one that has hydrogen bonding. Now, one of the things that this implies, or what happens, is that it turns out that this one here we've already talked about before. This one here is ethanol. This one here is a liquid at room temperature. This one, even though it has an identical molar mass, identical number of atoms, this one here is a gas at room temperature. So the fact that this one has strong attractions between the molecules is one of the things that causes this one here to be a liquid at room temperature. And we talk about life. We talked about water and its importance to life in here before. We'll talk about it again. Here's another reason why when scientists look for life in other parts of the universe, why we always look for water first. 
And it goes something like this. First of all, now this, we're not looking about watt at all. Let's just talk about intermolecular forces. These here represent the elements of group 14. That's these elements right here. These are the elements of group 14 if they're bonded with hydrogen. All of these here are going to be nonpolar molecules. And if we did a plot of their boiling point versus their molar mass, their boiling point is going to increase the heavier they become. And that's very easy to explain because if things get heavier, it requires them to take in more energy. They use up more energy when they're heavier. And trust me, I used to weigh like about 100 pounds. I have to eat a heck of a lot more now that I'm more than twice that to keep going. So again, we might compare it to like uh, car engines. Bigger cars have bigger engines because they require more energy. But now something interesting happens. These plots here now are plots of the elements of group 17, no, what is this, group 15, which would be nitrogen, phosphorus, um, arsenic, and antimony. Um, this one here is the plot of group 17, which is the elements fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. And the one in green here represents the elements of group 16. These are all if they're bonded with hydrogen. Now, if we ignore these three, we would see that all of them follow the same general trend that we just observed before. And that is, as we increase the molar mass, we also increase their boiling point. But what do these three here have in common with each other? Hydrogen. Well, they all have hydrogen, as do all of these here. But our topic of the day today is electronegativity and more importantly intermolecular forces. So in terms of intermolecular forces, what types of intermolecular forces do these three here all share in common with each other? These are ones that all have hydrogen bonds. These all three have hydrogen bonding. And if we ignore hydrogen bonding, that is, if hydrogen bonding didn't exist, what would happen is we'd see the boiling point of water right about here, the boiling point of HF about here, and the boiling point of NH3 about right here. All those boiling points would way, be way down here. And all of these would be gases at room temperature. But water is a liquid at room temperature because of the fact that it has very, very strong attractions between other molecules of water. And I understand we're going to run over here uh, about one or two minutes today, but I just wanted to show one quick point here as to why this is. If we looked at molecules of water, we talk about where this hydrogen bonding comes from and why it's so darn strong. Let's consider a whole bunch of water molecules together. And if we had a whole bunch of water molecules together, they would always orient themselves in such a manner that an oxygen atom of one molecule is always near a hydrogen atom of a different molecule. An oxygen of one molecule is always near the hydrogen of another. And that's because if we looked up those electronegativity values, we see that oxygen sits here at 3.5, hydrogen sits here at 2.1, so we have hydrogen at 2.1 oxygen at 3.5. If we label the partial positives and partial negatives, we'd have oxygen sitting here, partial negative. In all of these cases, hydrogen's always going to be partially positive. And what's going to happen then is that there's going to be the strong attraction that it occurs between these molecules of water. And that attraction is going to be strong because this difference in electronegativity is a difference of 1.4. And this here is a big difference. This is a big difference. And the larger that difference makes these molecules more polar. And the more polar they are, the stronger they're going to attract each other. But just like if we dumped a whole bunch of magnets into a bucket, they're going to attract each other. Now we compare it. Instead, let's say we replace this oxygen with something like sulfur. If we replace it with sulfur, 
come back here to sulfur, which has electronegativity of 2.5, the shapes of these molecules are all going to be identical, except instead of having oxygen in here, we would now have sulfur in there. They're still going to have attractions for each other. These attractions will exist. But instead of having a difference of 1.4 in the electronegativity, the difference here is only going to be 0. 0.4. That 0. 0.4 is no longer a very big difference. It's a very small difference. They are going to have some attraction for each other, but that attraction is not going to be very strong. So in the case of water, water is very unusual. It has that very large difference in electronegativity. As a result, it is sitting way up here in terms of its boiling point because its molecules are very, very strongly attract each other. And that's part of what makes life responsible here on Earth. The other thing is, just a minute here please, is if we look at the shape of those water molecules, this is what water looks like in the solid phase. For most substances, if we have a solid, they're going to be packed together. But water here, if we kind of turn this around and we look at this, we're always going to see that there's an oxygen of one molecule near hydrogen of another. Oxygen, hydrogen, oxygen, hydrogen. And that attraction is what holds them in place. And those bent molecules actually gives water a density that is less dense as a solid than it is as a liquid. In other words, ice floats. And as we talked about before, that's yet another reason why water is unique and why we look for it um, when we look for life elsewhere. So, any questions?